This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Alex Masper. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show. If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. Before I start talking anything sports, I want to remind you all of a couple of things. First, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever podcasting app or website you are listening to this on. To do that, you can just go to our homepage and hit the subscribe button. If you're on you know, Apple Podcasts, it'll be in the top right-hand corner with next to that plus sign that says subscribe. You want to subscribe to the podcast for a couple of reasons, but the main one being you get those alerts and those notifications on your phone, on your laptop, on your watch, on whatever you may be listening to this episode on. And you can always know when we drop a new episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast here at the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. So you can get those alerts and notifications and that way you can never miss an episode and be one of the first people to listen to a new episode when we release it again. Please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. We'd also really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star review or just a positive review on that same podcasting app or website on that same device. Uh, just to give us a boost of confidence to let us know that you guys are enjoying the content and discussion points and the structure of the show. And if you are, again, we would really appreciate it if you leave us a five-star review or just a positive review in general uh, on that same Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Podbean, whatever you might be listening to this on. Again, same thing. Just go to the homepage and click leave a review. That would give us a uh, big boost of confidence. Again, it would let us know that you guys are enjoying the structure of the show and everything about it. So that would be awesome if you could. And finally, if you could follow us on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram is where you can primarily follow us. Over there, we can interact and pretty much talk about anything over on social media. We can talk about sports. We can talk about life. We can do some live tweeting of some big-time hockey games or baseball games when the season starts. Whatever it may be, all of those interaction needs can be found on social media. So, again, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram is where you can primarily follow us, and we would love if you could do so. Uh, I hope wherever you are and however you may be listening, you and your family are happy and healthy during these extremely trying times in the world today. We have a fantastic show for you all today. Uh, later on in the episode, I do want to break down everything NBA trade deadline when it comes to Evan Fournier being traded from the Orlando Magic uh, to the Boston Celtics, how he'll do, I think, as a six-man role. We'll get into that at the end of the episode. The Miami Heat finally acquired Victor Oladipo after what it seems to be two years of rumors of him going there. He's finally a member of the Miami Heat. We'll break that down. Aaron Gordon also going to the Nuggets. That's another huge move. Lamarcus Aldridge, instead of signing with the Heat, signed with the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, and, of course, Andre Drummond also signed as a buyout player with the Los Angeles Lakers. So I want to break down all of those moves that's coming at the end of the episode. or will break down all of those awesome NBA moves and what it means for each of those contending teams who looked to upgrade at the deadline. Of course, we now have an incredible uh, NFL trade blockbuster. The day after the NBA trade deadline, uh, the NFL trade market decided to kick in. And we had one of the bigger trade acquisitions via draft capital in a while between the Dolphins, San Francisco and the Philadelphia Eagles. I want to break down what it means for all three of those teams. That's going to be coming up very soon. And because the draft order has changed so much, I will be giving you a top 10 uh, mock draft from those teams. Now, of course, San Francisco picking at three, Miami picking at six. How does that alter the draft board? And I'll give you another projected trade I have that I think will happen in the top five. That's also coming up later on in the show. And we are going to start off with that trade that was an absolute NFL blockbuster that really shook the sports world 
for the rest of the day and afternoon and the coming days. And there were two trades between the Miami Dolphins and San Francisco. And then after that, Miami traded back up to six with the Philadelphia Eagles. So I want to start with the San Francisco side of this because obviously, in my opinion, it is the more prevalent side uh, of the three-way trade. Again, it wasn't a three-team deal. It was two separate transactions. So we'll get to both, but they're really all connected. But the first one was when San Francisco traded up with the Miami Dolphins to secure the third overall pick uh, in this year's draft. So what ended up happening was the Miami Dolphins acquired the 12th overall pick, a 2022 first round pick from San Francisco, a 2022 third round pick. So both of those picks are next year. And then again, the year after in 2023, they would also get San Francisco's pick all for the third overall pick in this year's draft. So in at that point, Miami had moved down to 12. Uh, so San Francisco hops all the way up to number three in the draft in a move that, I'm not saying it was uh, not rumored. There was a lot of rumors, and I, I expected the Miami Dolphins to most likely trade down from the third overall pick. I did not ever believe that they were going to draft a quarterback, considering uh, I think Tua Tungavailo is the future for them. The only guy I think they would maybe move off of two or four would be Deshaun Watson, but he's obviously have a lot of off-the-field issues right now that he has to get situated. So I don't think Deshaun Watson's going anywhere at the moment. Uh, and it looks like this was a sign of confidence from the Dolphins that they're sticking with Tua going forward. There had been rumblings that the San Francisco 49ers were looking at a new quarterback situation. The Jimmy G rumors were sort of swirling. And they have been swirling ever since, really, the Super Super Bowl. I don't think uh, Jimmy Garoppolo deserves all the blame for the loss, but that one-time throw, I think he'll be thinking about that uh, for years, man. That one deep throw he had that he slightly overthrew in the end zone that would have won them that Super Bowl game against the Chiefs against San Francisco, outplayed Kansas City for three quarters of that game uh, and sort of fell apart in the fourth and let Mahomes sort of throw himself back into it, and they obviously came back and won the Super Bowl. And ever since really that throw, the Jimmy Garoppolo, you know, leaving San Francisco, upgrading a quarterback, rumors have been swirling. He also gets injured a lot, things like that. This was the move that finally signaled that Kyle Shanahan, the San Francisco 49ers, they want a new quarterback of the future. Not necessarily for this season, but of the future. They need a new quarterback really for 2022 and beyond. So they move all the way up to the third overall pick. They pay a hefty price. Again, they gave up uh, obviously their first round pick this year, their first round pick next year, their third round pick next year, and then their first round pick in 2023 as well. So three draft picks and your own first rounder this year in a trade swap to move up to the third overall pick, which means in my opinion, San Francisco has most likely already ID'd the guy that they want to draft at that third overall pick. So I think really the draft starts at four now. Now the great debate has been over Twitter, over ESPN, everything like that, all over the airways and everything. Uh, who is it? Who's the team? Who's the guy that's going to take uh, Trey Lance or Justin Fields? Because I think it's safe to assume at this point that the Jacksonville Jaguars are going to be taking Trevor Lawrence with the first overall pick. Eventually, the New York Jets are going to trade Sam Darnold and take Zach Wilson with the second overall pick. And now San Francisco's moved to the third overall pick, obviously for a quarterback. Justin Fields, Trey Lance, Mac Jones. Those are the three names that you're going to be seeing mocked to San Francisco uh, throughout the next coming month of the NFL draft. In my opinion, I think San Francisco has already fallen in love with a prospect so much that they felt the need to jump up to three now, set the market for a trade up in the draft now before it was too late. And in my opinion, that tr that guy has to be Trey Lance. I think that is the person, that is the quarterback, that's the prospect that San Francisco has been eyeing for the past couple of months now. They showed up at his pro day and Trey Lance had a really, really nice pro day, wowed a lot of scouts, did not play this year. Obviously, his season was canceled due to COVID. I think uh, his school played spring ball, but I think he opted out just to opt for the draft. Obviously, there was no combine this year and everything, but he did have a pro day, showed off all of those traits. A lot of people have been calling him Josh Allen 2.0. Now, I I'm going to give you my pro comparison for him, and, and I do think it is Josh Allen. I think that is a valid uh, sort of analysis for him. I, I almost also view him as a – he's smaller than Josh Allen, right? So Josh Allen is 6'5", 6'6". Lance is on the 6'3", 6'4", side. Now, he is faster than Josh Allen. He is a lot faster, I think, due to his size and things like that. Uh, but the arm strength is not there necessarily with Allen, but I do – think that uh, Trey Lance is more accurate coming out of college than Josh Allen is. But similar type guy, a project. He's not going to be walking into the NFL giving you 
uh, what, you know, an MVP like rookie year, an Andrew Luck rookie year, uh, a Justin Herbert rookie year, to be quite honest with you. He's not going to be doing that. He's going to be having a lot of interceptions his rookie year, uh, you know, raw traits, ability, things like that. If you start him, now, of course, Patrick Mahomes was that prospect as well a couple of years ago. Kansas City took him, did not play him the whole year, and they sort of unveiled the Ferrari and, you know, that next, that following year, his second year of his career, when he was ready, when he learned the playbook, when he adjusted to some NFL lifestyle things, when he was able to dissect defenses a little bit better. And again, some guys just need a year to sit. Aaron Rodgers sat, things like that. And ever since the Patrick Mahomes situation sort of unveiled itself, people have always been comparing guys to sitting for a year. Even some people said last year that Tua Tungavailoa should have sat the whole year. People have always been talking about that guy with traits that if you can put it all together, things really explode. And when people go to prospects like Trey Lance, in my opinion, their career is entirely dictated on where they land. When you have the guy, that one prospect every year that's all about the traits, that maybe didn't have a great winning record in college, or, you know, which Trey Lance didn't, obviously. We'll talk about how he did have a great winning record uh, in his stats in a moment. But again, a lot of guys come out with traits. They're super young. They're tall. They have the big arm. They're fast. But they don't have the accuracy. They don't have the mechanics. They, you know, haven't shined at the biggest stage. They don't have a lot of experience. Whatever it may be, there's always that one guy in the draft. This year it's Trey Lance, and I think he's going to be taken with the third overall pick by San Francisco. I said, when guys like prospects like this, it all depends on where you land, it matters, right? So for Josh Allen, if he landed with the Jets instead of the Bills, I don't think Josh Allen would be the MVP candidate you saw last year. The Bills have a great coach in Sean McDermott. They have a great front office, great ownership. Uh, they make moves in the offseason to help their rookie quarterbacks. The Jets didn't add a single pro bowler for Sam Darnold the last couple of seasons, but you see the Bills training for guys like Stephon Diggs, etc. So and where you land matters for these guys. And for Kyle Shanahan to be able to take, I think, Trey Lance is who they're eyeing and who they're going to pick with the third overall pick. Again, I'll get into Justin Fields and Mac Jones in a second, but specifically, I, I really am confident, and I will put in my mock draft later in the show, that they take him um, at three. Uh, I think it's going to be a home run pick, and I think Trey Lance is going to be able to thrive in a Kyle Shanahan zone read system that has obviously needed an upgrade at quarterback last season. I don't think, though, they're going to trade Jimmy, Jimmy Garoppolo. I think a lot of people, including myself, honestly, when the initial trade happened, I thought, wow, so where's the where's the text, where's the alert, where's the Schefter bomb, wherever it is, that Jimmy Garoppolo has been traded to the Patriots. That's what I thought was a secondary move. Then I thought about it for a little more, and I was like, no. They're going to go after Trey Lance, and they're going to start Jimmy Garoppolo to start this season because they're in win-now mode still. And they're going to have new coordinators all over this field, specifically on defense. They lost a lot of players this year to free agency to the Jets. Uh, they obviously lost Robert Sala. They've obviously lost a lot of key pieces, including their offensive coordinator as well. Uh, So it's going to be interesting to see how the new coaching staff really bounces back uh, with these new additions, with new guys taking new roles. And you might not want to have a new, uh, you know, a third of your coaching staff being new or promoted from within and a rookie quarterback. That might be too tough uh, to handle for one year, specifically when you're in the toughest division in football with teams like Arizona, the Rams, who obviously made a big deal for Matt Stafford, and the Seahawks. So you're in a tough division. You don't want to maybe throw the rookie out there with the Wolves when you have a whole new defensive coaching staff, potentially, since Robert Sala took a lot of his assistance with him to the New York Jets. Same on the offensive side of the ball. So I think they're really going to sit Trey Lance the entirety of next season. But I think Trey Lance, when you take a look at the stats, his sophomore season, obviously he was 20 years old, and he still is 20 years old, uh, played in 16 games, threw for a little under 3,000 yards, about 2,800 yards, 28 touchdowns, and no interceptions. You heard that right. 28 touchdowns, no interceptions, uh, wins a ton of games. Uh, Rushing-wise, he also ran for over 1,000 yards and 14 touchdowns. So he was responsible, essentially, for 42 touchdowns, no interceptions, and an absolutely wild sophomore season. Did not get to play his junior year, obviously canceled because of COVID. But when you talk about even guys with the traits, like Josh Allen, who didn't have those statistics in college, didn't have the winning record that Trey Lance does in college, he was one of the most polished uh, trait, hashtag trait, you know, prospects that I've seen in the draft. I think he's more polished then on Josh Allen, I, I think he's up there in the in the Patrick Mahomes level of polish. When I think Mahomes could have started some games his rookie year, obviously sat the whole year. But if Trey Lance can go to San Francisco, like I believe he will, sit the whole year behind Jimmy Garoppolo, you could see the guy that we saw in college sophomore season uh, for Trey Lance in San Francisco really, really soon. But I don't think San Francisco wants to risk throwing away a year. Again, you have a new offensive coordinator, a new defensive coordinator. Do you want to add a new quarterback on top of all that in the hardest division in football? I don't think so. I don't think that's a 
the smartest move for Trey Lance's development either. And hey, if you do have a great bounce back year uh, with your new coaching staff on the defensive side of the ball, and, it, and you know the defense doesn't miss a beat despite Robert Sala uh, taking a job with the New York Jets, and uh, you can sort of roll through and make the playoffs, and Jimmy Garoppolo has a great year, then Jimmy Garoppolo's value just skyrocketed to a first-round pick. And then maybe next year, after the Patriots say they miss the playoffs again, despite making the off-season moves of John o. Smith and uh, Hunter Henry, let's say Cam just isn't the player we thought, and he continues to struggle, they miss the playoffs, then you could ask the Patriots for a first-round pick for Jimmy G. So it could be sort of like a value-raiser season for Jimmy Garoppolo next season. Again, if you remember, I think Alex Smith traded to Washington, got a pretty hefty draft uh, compensation, at least for Alex Smith at his age, and they got a lot back uh, in terms of uh, Kansas City draft capital after trading Alex Smith. I think Jimmy Garoppolo would be better than Alex Smith was at that stage, specifically for a lot of QB desperate teams, like maybe New England, who won't have a top-end draft pick, but maybe they just barely missed the playoffs and they're looking for an upgraded QB. Then you unveil Trey Lance in 2022. That's the path that I see San Francisco taking, and I absolutely love it for them. Again, so when you're talking about giving up three first-round picks and a third-round pick, it sounds hefty. It sounds like, oh my God, you gave away the future. But if Kyle Shanahan, when we when he uses, he, he got Matt Ryan to an MVP level. And if you, we've always talked about what if they got their hands on Deshaun Watson, a mobile quarterback for the zone read system that is so fantastic at creating running schemes, uh, making any runner look good in the system. Yards after catch from the receivers to the tight ends, the running backs to the offensive line, creating incredible running holes in that complicated zone read system. We've always talked about how an athletic quarterback would absolutely thrive in a system like Kyle Shanahan. Trey Lance would be the absolute perfect guy to do it. And he can obviously do it with his arm as well. 28 touchdowns. No interceptions. He is that mobile traits guy that doesn't turn the football over. Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen threw a ton of interceptions in college. Trey Lance threw none, which is absolutely crazy to me. He hasn't thrown an interception since high school, which is wild, uh, and he hasn't lost a game in a long time either. I think it's going to be a slam run, a home run slam dunk pick uh, for the San Francisco 49ers. And again, they give up those three first round picks to move up. But again, this was a bigger deal than just that. The Miami Dolphins also traded back up to six. And, of course, the Eagles traded down to 12. So we're going to get to that part of the transaction uh, coming up right after this short break. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Here at the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Alex Masper. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show. If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. I just finished giving you my spiel on the 49ers side of this trade. Again, I think the guy they are targeting with now the third overall pick in the NFL draft is Trey Lance. He is the one who has had a pro day. Uh, scouts have been able to see him in person. I'm sure John Lynch, the 49ers general manager, was there. Hell, maybe even Kyle Shanahan was there. Again, I think they view an opportunity. Again, like they said, they have a Super Bowl caliber roster. There was a report that came out that San Francisco does not want to move on from Jimmy Garoppolo this year, that they have a Super Bowl caliber roster. And again, with all the coaching changes that they had on their staff because of what the Jets took from them and some other teams, I really do believe they're not going to want to put in Trey Lance, who's more of a project-type quarterback in there as rookie year. I think they'll give him the Mahomes treatment and let Jimmy Garoppolo hopefully improve his trade value this season, hopefully lead the 49ers to the playoffs. 
then trade Jimmy G to a team like New England, maybe, who could be desperate for a quarterback next year but not have the top picks. Again, next year's quarterback class via the draft isn't great, isn't anything special like this one's being hyped up to be. Not that there won't be some guys like Sam Howell and some others who will be there, of course. And, of course, there's always a surprise guy who's going to win the Heisman and shoot all the way up there and things like that. Uh, but as of right now, it's not an enticing class, so who knows if Jimmy G can raise his trade value, who could be moved, maybe even by the deadline or something like that. But I really do believe it's Trey Lance that they are securing with the third overall pick. I'll do that mock draft later on in the show, and I will also be breaking down a lot of NBA trade deadline moves at the very end of the show, so you want to stick around for that. But now I want to talk about the other sides of this absolute blockbuster trade. And if you want to talk about who are the winners of this trade, again, I think it was interesting in all three sides. Um, For San Francisco, it was obvious they are trading up to get a quarterback at three. For Miami, they wanted to trade down from three because they have their quarterback of the future in Tua Tungavailoa, and they want to secure weapons for him. Uh, So they get all the way down to 12, then back up to six, which I'll talk to in a minute. Of course, Philly has a bunch of other needs. Uh, besides, you know, they really have a need at every position almost, except for some defensive and offensive line things they're pretty solid at. So they traded down, got some more picks as well. So let's talk about those other sides. Let's talk about the real winner of this trade, in my opinion, which is the Miami Dolphins. Again, not that there has to be a winner of this trade. I think in all, in, in in actuality, all sides won. I think San Francisco got what they wanted, Miami got what they wanted, and I think Philly got what they wanted. So I think all three sides, I don't think this was a bad trade for anybody. I don't think anybody got screwed or you know, fleeced like they like to say or anything like that. I think this was a great trade on all sides. But I think the team that really escaped with the most was really the Miami Dolphins. And general manager Chris Greer really deserves a round of applause for completely manipulating the draft board. Now, the Miami Dolphins, since Brian Flores and Chris Greer have sort of came in. Chris Greer has been with the Dolphins now for about 20 years, worked his way up, finally got the general manager position, hired Brian Flores, Uh, And really, ever since then, the Dolphins have looked like a competent, well-run organization, which hasn't really been the case since Dan Marino retired. So uh, to see that, it's good as Dolphin fans are obviously celebrating this trade. And again, they had the third overall pick. So last year, they essentially are ready to, quote-unquote, tank for Tua. They go, they win five out of their last, and I think nine or eight or nine games. They go five and 11 on the year after starting off the season 0 and 8. Uh, and they really have a fire sale of a team at the beginning of that season. And they traded Laramie Tunsil, I believe, I think it was two games in, to the Houston Texans for those two first-round picks and a second-round pick. And again, it was part of the Miami Dolphins' fire sale. It looked like a good move on the Texans' part for securing a left tackle of the future for Deshaun Watson. Fast forward to a year today. Uh, last, or excuse, Fast forward, actually, let's go to the last year's draft. The Dolphins have three first-round picks. Uh, one from their own, one from Pittsburgh for trading for Mika Fitzpatrick, and then the other one from the Texans. So they, due to the Texans pick, they get Noah Iganagami in the first round, that cornerback. And then, of course, they land Tua Tungvaluwa with the fifth overall pick, their quarterback of the present and also now future. And then you fast forward to this year, the Texans have a dumpster fire season, and they're gifted the third overall pick for Laramie Tunsil and the third overall pick in the second round of this year's draft as well. Not to mention... Uh, they traded it now. So they go to the third overall pick for the Miami Dolphins, and they, they're saying, look at this. We know that quarterbacks are going to go at the top of this draft. We know how good the quarterback class is. Everybody knows Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson are one and two, but teams are so high on Trey Lance and also Justin Fields and Mac Jones. We could see five quarterbacks go in the top ten. That could really happen. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. That is a real possibility at this stage with now teams moving up and the draft a little, being a little over a month away now. We could see five quarterbacks go. So Dolphins go, look, we're not in the quarterback market this year. We like what Tua showed last year going 6-3 and three as a starter. They had the worst receiving core in the NFL last season, not named the New England Patriots or New York Jets. They were last in the league in percentage of separation on routes. Their receivers just flat out did not get open, forcing Ryan Fitzpatrick and Tua Tungavailoa to really throw into tight windows, which of course is hard to do when you're coming from a system in Alabama that has guys wide open all over the field, not to mention his injury. Things like that. So they believe in Tua going forward. So they're going to give him another shot here in year two with some weapons. And they realize that they don't have to take one of these weapons at pick three. They can trade down and still guarantee themselves a Devontae Smith, Jamar Chase, Kyle Pitts, or Jalen Waddle. Those are the four guys I believe Miami is considering. You can throw Panay Sewell in there as well. Uh, but I don't think they're going to go offensive line. They drafted a left tackle in the first round last year, Austin Jackson. Robert Hunt played a lot of right tackle for them this year. Uh, he was also a rookie out of Louisiana State, who they are very high on as well. So I don't think they're going to go offensive line in the first round necessarily. So I think, again, that big four of the weapons that you've been hearing about essentially all offseason, Jalen Waddell, Kyle Pitts, 
uh, Jamar Chase and Devonta Smith. Those are the guys that the Dolphins are going to be looking at. In my opinion, they're going to focus in on one of those four. So you got to realize, they don't need to take one of them and pick three, especially if they want to manipulate the draft board. So they want to pick, essentially, Miami, the team that's going to have the third overall pick. I'm sure New England called. They didn't want to trade in division. I'm sure some other teams called as well. But instead, they give it to the NFC team, San Francisco, to move all the way up to the third overall pick. And again, at that time, Miami had moved down to 12, which was out of the top 10 and what you could argue was, you know, out of reach for sure on Devonta Smith, Kyle Pitts, and Jamar Chase. There's no way any of those three guys are falling to 12. Maybe Jalen Waddell gets to 12, but that would probably be the latest he would get selected. So again, you traded all the way down there, and then you're really questioning, who who are the Dolphins going to pick? But they did pick up a first-round pick next year from San Francisco in 2022, a third-round pick next year from San Francisco in 2022, and a 2023 first-round pick. So they loaded up on draft capital, and we're going to have two first-round picks next year and the year after. But of course, Miami, in wanting to get these weapons for Tua, decides, no, 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 we need to trade back up. So they did a perfect job at maximizing their draft capital while only trading down three slots. They ended up going from 12 into a separate trade that same day, really about 10 minutes later, uh, to the Philadelphia Eagles. They move all the way up to sixth overall, and they also give a... uh, uh, I think a fourth round pick next year or this year and a first round pick in 2022 and they move up to sixth overall and also get a fifth round pick this year. So essentially Miami decided to get a first and a fifth, right? So we're going to talk about a first in 2022. So the, also on a side note, the first that they're sending Philadelphia in 2022 was not the 2022 first they uh, got from San Francisco in trading up. So the only first round pick the Miami Dolphins will have in 2022 is San Francisco's. They will not have their own. Their own first will be in the hands of Philadelphia. So Miami is also banking on the fact that in 2022, probably the year Kyle Shanahan's going to start Trey Lance uh, or Justin Fields, if you want to talk about him, or Mac Jones, uh, when they're going to unveil their rookie quarterback, the Dolphins will own that first round pick. So they are banking on the fact that they will be better than San Fran in 2022. And essentially Miami got a first, a third, and um, a fifth round pick. Oh, it costs a couple of years, obviously just for moving down three spots in the NFL draft, and they definitely are going to be able to get the guy that they still want. Now, who do they want? That is the best question, and that's really where the draft starts, are you, when it comes to offensive weapons, right? Because we know that the first three picks are probably going to be quarterbacks. Who knows? It could be the first four, maybe even five picks if Atlanta and Cincinnati trade down, and I really do believe that Miami is going to be the first team to select an offensive weapon, so they're going to have anybody at their disposal, Devonta Smith, Jalen Waddle, Jamar Chase, and Kyle Pitts. Now, I want to talk about what's being rumored for Miami to select. Now, I am a firm believer that Kyle Pitts is the best offensive weapon in this draft class, and I have mocked him to the Miami Dolphins with the third overall pick, my last two mocks. Now, unfortunately for like, whatever, some personal Dolphin fans or for my personal own opinion, it's not looking like Miami is focused on Kyle Pitts. Again, these are just sources that are coming out. There's a lot of smoke. Who knows? Maybe Miami is just leaking this to the media so nobody will take Kyle Pitts ahead of them. But it's looking like Miami is considering three people. Jamar Chase, Devonta Smith, and there's also been some rumblings about Jalen Waddell as well. But I really think it's going to come down to Jamar Chase or Devonta Smith for the Miami Dolphins, which is why I want to focus in on this. When you look at Devonta Smith, he has been at Alabama for four years now. His freshman year, he played eight games, and he played 13 games in the following three years. He did not miss a single game that he was asked to play in in his Alabama career. There's a big concern about his weight. I'm not overly concerned at him playing at 160. There are guys like Marvin Harrison and Chad Ochocinco Johnson who played around that weight as well and had absolutely no problems going forward. Now, you, it's obviously last season, his Heisman winning season, where he had 117 catches, 1,800 yards, 23 touchdowns was that pop year for him where everybody knew Devonta Smith's name. But of course, we've known about Devonta Smith since his freshman year when ironically, Tua Tungavailoa threw him that game-winning touchdown pass against Georgia in the national championship game. And again, he has had a steadily improved season and career really his entire four years at Alabama. He went from 160 yards his freshman year to 693 his second year. Then he gets over the 1,000-yard mark with 1,256 in 2019 his junior year with 14 touchdowns. And arguably, he would have been a day-two pick in last year's draft. But decided to stay for his senior year, and it was obviously good for him. He won the Blinkoff Award, which is the best wide receiver in the country's award. And, of course, the Heisman Trophy winner as well. So you got to keep in mind, he is older than Jamar Chase. He has played two, four more, two more college seasons than Jamar Chase has. Jamar Chase obviously opted out his junior year um, of LSU, did not play this year because of COVID and things like that. Wanted to focus on going to the draft. So he has no tape, no film from this year. And the last film we see of Jamar Chase is from that, of course, uh, Blinkoff winning season that he had in 2019. So Devontae Smith's junior year 
when uh, Jamar Chase was only a sophomore, he had 84 catches for 1,780 yards and 20 touchdowns, and that was the year, obviously, Joe Burrow uh, and that LSU Tiger team won the national championship, which was arguably widely considered to be one of the best, if not the best, college football teams of all time. So we didn't get to see what a junior year or even senior year Jamar Chase would look like, uh, like we saw a junior and senior year version of Devonta Smith. And honestly, for that reason, because both of these guys are absolutely incredible, are going to be home drum draft picks uh, either way. Uh, I think Miami can't really go wrong here. Jalen Waddle, uh, I think, would be the one pick that I'd scratch my head at a little bit. Because I think if you want to get Jalen Waddle, you could even trade down from six. I don't think Jalen Waddle will be taken in the top six. But again, if you want Pitts, Jamar Chase, or Devonta Smith, all of those guys can be argued as a top five selection. Obviously, the Miami picks at six, so it would be valid there. Uh, for them as well. But again, we never got to see, you know, if you just look at their sophomore seasons, that's what I'm saying. When, when Javonta Smith and Jamar Chase were the same age, Devonta Smith was a worse receiver than Jamar Chase. Again, you have to keep in mind the roster that Devonta Smith was sitting behind. At that time, Calvin Ridley was there. Uh, also, that was his freshman year. We've obviously seen Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, Jalen Waddles also there. So he's had to sit behind a lot of really talented first round pick guys in the NFL now. Uh, so maybe that's why the stats are a little off. Again, you can't go wrong here. If, if I had to pick somebody, though, I, I really do believe Devontae Smith is going to be the guy Miami takes at six. He would not be my pick. He would be my second choice. Again, I love everything about Jamar Chase, and I do think he is a better receiver uh, prospect than Devonta Smith. I do believe that personally. I, I really do. And again, I've given you my offensive weapon rankings, and I've put uh, number one, Uh, Kyle Pitts, number two, Jamar Chase, number three, Devonta Smith. And I still believe that. I think if you're going based off pure wide receiver prospect and no other factors, I think Jamar Chase might bring a little bit more upside than Devonta Smith. I think both of them are going to be Hall of Fame caliber players. But that partnership that Devonta Smith and uh, and Tua Tungavailoa have at Alabama, Tua needs a safety blanket. He has obviously been ridiculed and criticized a lot his rookie year in Miami despite going six and three. His weapons are not used to his playing style. They don't play fast. They're not really, you know, separation receivers. Get a guy who who was known to play with Tua Tagovailoa and thrived under Tua Tagovailoa as well. And they've known each other since their freshman year when they connected on that arguably greatest play in college football history was that game-winning national championship throw and catch that they connected on their freshman year when they were 18 years old. Now, of course, they could both be in the NFL playing for the same team. That is the reason why I think Miami will take Devonta Smith. If I had to pick somebody from Miami, I'd take Kyle Pitts. And if, again, I had to pick a wide receiver prospect, I'd take Jamar Chase. But, again, Jamar Chase is not as fast as Devonta Smith, honestly, on tape. When you look at it, I think Devonta Smith creates more separation than Jamar Chase on routes. I think Jamar Chase is a better, more physical, and all-around built receiver. But I do think I see Marvin Harrison 2.0 and Devonta Smith. And that's something I don't know you can pass up on. Again, I see a faster Anquan Bolden than Jamar Chase. Both Hall of Fame options, and I think both of them will absolutely be studs in the NFL. But I really do believe that that Devonta Smith is going to be the guy that they take at number six overall for the Miami Dolphins. Reunite that dream pairing between Devonta Smith and Tua Tungvaluwa. And not only does Miami get to you know potentially reunite the Heisman winner wide receiver with his former quarterback at Alabama, Tua Tungvaluwa, and get Tua some familiarity, a guy who knows how to play with Tua, run routes the way Tua likes to get open, things like that. Uh, they also pick up another first in 2023. They have San Francisco's first in 2022 as well, though they did trade their own to Philadelphia. They also picked up a third and a fifth round pick just for moving down three slots and still getting the guy they were probably looking at all along, which is, in my opinion, Devonta Smith. It's going to be absolutely fascinating to see the situation play out overall with the Miami Dolphins and their draft speculation. They have so many picks over the next couple of years, and Chris Greer really does deserve a lot of credit for manipulating the draft board the way that he does. All right, that's going to do it for this segment. On the other side of this short break, I will quickly give you my Philadelphia side. Again, I don't think there's a lot of complexity to it, but I will give you why I think Philadelphia agreed to move down from 6 to 12. And then I will also give you my updated uh, mock draft with this new draft order. Where do I have players going and why? Uh, We're going to give you that updated mock draft also coming up right after this short break. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info.
All right, and we are back here at the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Alex Masfer. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show. If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. I just finished giving you the Miami Dolphins side of that absolutely incredible uh, you know, crazy trade blockbuster where multiple picks were being moved in every which way. Again, I think if you had to pick a winner of this trade, I think all three teams really got what they wanted, what they were looking for in this trade. I think you'd have to go with Miami just because of the amount of draft capital they were able to add. Again, a potential top pick in 2022 if a rookie quarterback struggles with San Francisco, a first in 2023, uh, a third and a fifth as well is absolutely an incredible haul just to move down three spots and probably get the same guy you were looking for all along at pick three. Uh, So I think it was an absolutely incredible haul for Chris Greer and the Miami Dolphins organization from top to bottom, I want to explain now quickly why I think Philadelphia was in on this. So, obviously, Philadelphia, there was also a report that came out that they wanted to actually move up before moving down. So, there was a big rumor that they were trying to move up to three with Miami or two with the Jets to secure Zach Wilson. That is the guy they were looking for the whole time. They obviously fell in love with Zach Wilson, the prospect, and wanted to do whatever they can to move up. They thought the price was too high to go after him to go all the way up to three or two. So they decided after Miami traded down to 12 that they're also going to trade down as well. And since Miami wanted to move back up into the top 10, it sort of worked out perfectly. Uh, In return for moving down six spots, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles got the Miami Dolphins 2022 first round pick. So Miami actually got a bigger haul from San Francisco to move down in total three spots. Then Philly got to move down six spots, which doesn't seem great. But again, it it was just a crazy trade how it worked. But Philadelphia has a lot more needs than just a quarterback, if you want to say. They obviously trust Jalen Hurts at some level, but they're not sold on him being the face of the franchise going forward as they wanted to go after Zach Wilson. So I'm sure they compared Jalen Hurts' tape in the NFL and college to those of Mac Jones, Justin Fields, and Trey Lance, and they felt more confident in Jalen Hurts than those three guys because they only wanted Zach Wilson, and I'm sure they thought that Trevor Lawrence was absolutely unavailable, which he obviously is. But if they could have gotten Zach Wilson, they would have liked to. They couldn't, so they decided to move down, pick up more draft capital in 2022, which is going to be important specifically if Philadelphia is the worst team in the league next year. Now, if Nick Sirianni and the new coaching staff can't really coach up this not-talented roster and Jalen Hurts struggles and turns out to be a not-good quarterback in the NFL, Philadelphia could have the number one overall pick next year in 2022, in addition to the Miami Dolphins' 2022 first-round pick as well. So similar to what the Jacksonville Jaguars have in draft capital, this year with two first round picks including the number one overall pick Philadelphia could be having as soon as next year as well so they're going to give Jalen Hurts a full year with this roster sort of test it out and see how he does with 16 games under his belt in the new Nick Sirianni system and if he thrives he thrives and they have their quarterback of the future in Philadelphia and they can use those two first round picks in 22 on weapons around him or things like that similar to what the Miami Dolphins are doing right now they have their quarterback to Otsunga Bailoa they're using all these firsts and seconds and thirds uh, to get him weapons and a team to really completely build around on him uh, specifically on the off- offensive side of the ball so in for Philadelphia it's a win-win assuming you still get the guy you were looking at at 12 I thought them going from 6 to 12 was interesting because I know that they want a probably a receiver a weapon somebody who the, he can they can sell the fans on uh, for this next upcoming season uh, so again going all the way down to 12 was interesting to me but I think I have an idea of the guy who they potentially want so again that's in my opinion Philadelphia is doing the classic. We are in stage one of a rebuild. We are not close to contending. Despite how bad the division is in the NFC East, Washington got a lot better by adding Curtis Samuel and Ryan Fitzpatrick. Obviously, the Cowboys will get Dak Prescott back next season, and he also signed that mega extension. And we know the Giants got Galladay and brought in some other guys as well. So those three teams got better, while Philadelphia got worse all across the board. Plus, not to mention a new head coach. There's a very real chance that Philadelphia is the worst team in the NFL next season, uh, top to bottom. They could have the number one overall pick next year. So instead of sort of going all in on this year and staying at six and maybe getting a Kyle Pitts or something like that, they trade back, focus on 2022. Again, I, I want to know. I want to know though who what's their draft board is looking like essentially. So because uh, they they obviously feel confident that the guy that they really really liked at six. Uh, is going to be available to them at 12. Otherwise, they don't make this move. Same thing with the Miami Dolphins. They they feel avail- that the guy they wanted at three is going to be available at six. And they're pretty certain enough. And they're so certain that they're willing to tr- make that trade a month ahead of the draft. Again, we're still a month away. This isn't a draft day trade. This wasn't a day before the draft when draft boards are completely set. We're still a month out of the draft. So a lot of guys haven't had pro days yet, including guys like Justin Fields. 
So it, they, they are very set in stone of who they believe they can get at 12, and they're confident that that guy's going to be there. So with all further ado, we're going to give you an updated mock draft here. Now, we are a month away from the draft, so I'm changing the way I do my mock drafts from here on out. Usually, what I like to do in my mock drafts is give you what I would do if I were the general manager in each of all these teams, and I gave you the top 10. Now that we're a month away, instead of me playing the role of general manager for the team, I'm going to give you my personal prediction. So this isn't necessarily what I would do if I was the GM of the Dolphins or Panthers or 49ers or any of these teams, but this is what I believe is going to happen based off reports, analysis, scheme fit, relationship. This is my personal prediction for the top picks of this draft. So again, we're doing mock drafts in a little bit of a different way now. And instead of just the top 10 picks, I'm going to be giving you the top 15 picks in the NFL draft now. So the drafts, the mock drafts leading up to the real NFL draft later this month in April, uh, I'll be giving you the top 15 picks. And again, if me instead of me playing that role of GM, doing what I would do, this is more of a personal prediction uh, of who I believe will be taken, where, and why. So let's get right into it. With the first overall pick, nothing's going to change here. The Jacksonville Jaguars are still going to take Trevor Lawrence, in my opinion. I understand that the Zach Wilson hype train is real. And yes, you could make the argument that Zach Wilson on tape appears to be a better playmaker than Trevor Lawrence. And again, I'm super high on Zach Wilson as well. I do understand why some people are comparing him as sort of a Kyler Murray, Patrick Mahomes hybrid. And that's definitely his ceiling. And I could 100% see that happening. But my ceiling for Trevor Lawrence is John Elway. Uh, A little bit skinnier. I'd like him to beef up. But I think his mobile side hasn't been shown enough in college because how good he was at Clemson, how good really those Clemson teams were. He is a quarterback prodigy. He's been anointed the first overall pick really since he was 16 years old. Uh, He was the number one quarterback recruit coming out of high school, number one quarterback recruit definitely coming out of college. And he's 100% the best quarterback prospect I have seen since Andrew Luck. Some people want to take it all the way back to John Elway or Peyton Manning or some of the other all-time great quarterback prospects that we just knew for sure heading into that college season that they were going to be the number one overall pick and they follow through and they're the number one overall pick for sure in that year's draft class. I think Trevor Lawrence is just going to be a better version of Justin Herbert. It wouldn't surprise me if he breaks all of the records that Justin Herbert set this year in passing yards and passing touchdowns and yardage per game and things like that. Uh, pairing him up with Urban Meyer is definitely going to be one of the more fun fits to watch. That's definitely an underrated storyline in the NFL this season. And I'm super excited to see what Trevor Lawrence is going to be able to bring to the NFL and specifically Jacksonville. So again, with the first overall pick, I have the Jacksonville Jaguars taking quarterback Trevor Lawrence out of Clemson, as everybody should expect. Uh, And I think that's pretty much a lock heading into April. Another lock that I believe will truly happen is the Jets taking Zach Wilson at pick number two. Again, he just had his pro day, showed off some crazy arm talent ability, throwing on the run away from his body, throwing across his body opposite field, stuff like that that will really wow a team like the New York Jets. Again, they're running also a a Shanahan-style Uh, offense with the zone read system it would thrive with a mobile quarterback Zach Wilson is a perfect fit for that offense Uh, he's going to start right out of the gate I do believe they will end up trading Sam Darnold to what team I'm not sure I I would keep an eye on a team like the like the Broncos I think Drew Locke uh, and a Sam Darnold quarterback competition in the Broncos future would be something that would benefit uh, Sam Darnold a lot and I think he would beat out Drew Locke and win that I think the Denver Broncos would get Better. There are a lot of rumors that they were very high on Sam Darnold heading into the draft. Another team I would like to say to keep an eye on is the Patriots, but I doubt the Jets trade within division. Looks like the Bears are set in stone on uh, Andy Dalton, so I'm not seeing a whole lot of teams Sam Darnold could go to. I would really keep an eye on the Broncos there, but eventually I believe Sam Darnold will be moved. The Jets will take Zach Wilson with the second overall pick. Again, quarterback out of BYU. Uh, was third in the nation, I believe, in passing yards. He was fantastic for BYU up and across the board. He does have a weakness with pressure in his face, I'd like to say. Uh, but again, nobody's a perfect quarterback prospect. I think he's going to do great things in New York, assuming that they're going to be able to build things around him. But again, the Jets have seemed to have nice you know, uh, head coaching hires before and things uh, have gone down the wrong path. I'm a big fan of Joe Douglas and Robert Sala, but again, I was also a really big fan of Todd Bowles when he was hired in New York, and he didn't work out there as well. That's a really tough division for a rookie quarterback to go into to face Bill Belichick, Sean McDermott, and uh, Brian Flores twice a year each is going to be really tarred for any quarterback Uh, to really go through, let alone a rookie quarterback. So it wouldn't surprise me if Zach Wilson struggled out of the gate a little bit, but I do think the Jets will sort of hand him the keys to the kingdom right away, and he will obviously be selected with the second overall pick. Uh, With the third overall pick, I really do believe that Trey Lance is the guy that San Francisco is going to focus in on. I think they have identified that his traits and what his ceiling can be 
is a faster, smaller version of Josh Allen. Uh, I'm not saying he's got Lamar Jackson speed, but he plays that sense. He's got that running style, that flashy, electric, uh, sort of home run hitting running style. And I think that combined with his pretty deep ball ability is going to do wonders in a Kyle Shanahan-like offense. I do believe they'll sit in behind Jimmy Garoppolo a year, and I don't hate it. In fact, I agree with the decision. But I do believe that you don't trade up to three unless you're taking a guy that you think eventually will win you multiple Super Bowls one day. And I think Trey Lance has that ceiling to be able to do so. And I think it's going to be a home run uh, partnership between the 49ers and Trey Lance. Good for Trey Lance, hopefully, that he gets to land with a competent coach, a competent organization, just like Josh Allen did, just like Patrick Mahomes did, so we can hopefully see him unlock his true potential. So again, with the third overall pick, I have the 49ers taking Trey Lance with the fourth overall pick. I do believe the Falcons will eventually trade down from this pick. I think almost the Dolphins trading down to six and accumulating all this draft capital will inspire them to trade down. Again, there's been a lot of rumors of them taking quarterbacks, including myself. I think that they should go after a mobile guy. Arthur Smith does a lot with mobile quarterbacks and effectively saved Ryan Tannehill's career. But Matt Ryan is one of the best play-action quarterbacks in the NFL. He's top three in that category. And Arthur Smith and the Tennessee Titans were the second biggest play-action team in the entire league only behind San Francisco I believe so I think they'll stick with Matt Ryan this year also his contract restructure to free up cap space this year and have a bigger cap hit next year sort of signifies that they're in with Matt Ryan for the long haul at least maybe the next year or two so I think they're going to trade down from this pick for number four and I think the Panthers from eight are going to trade up I think that the Sean Watson thing right now off the field is going to scare a lot of teams away I think it already scared the Miami Dolphins away they've traded out of the third overall pick down to six so again if you're going to trade or make a run for Deshaun Watson you're going to want to have the highest pick possible at three so again I think that scared Miami away and I think eventually Carolina will be scared away from the whole Deshaun Watson situation as well they'll trade up with the Falcons at four and they will get Justin Fields who I think would be a home run pick uh, for everybody, Matt Rule, the entire organization in Carolina. Justin Fields, in my opinion, is the quarterback prospect that we see every year that gets nitpicked, that gets overshadowed. It was Justin Herbert last year because, again, it's sort of prospect fatigue. We've heard about these guys for so long. We're almost like, do something new. We've seen you be good for so long already. Uh, but, again, I can't get out of my head Justin Fields' game versus Clemson where he outplayed Trevor Lawrence. My pro comparison for him is uh, Dak Prescott, and I think a Matt Rule, Joel Brady offense would be fantastic for him, and I think he would start right out of the gate. So I think we're going to get four straight quarterbacks essentially eventually. I think the Falcons will eventually trade down uh, to the eighth overall pick. And the Panthers will come up to four and make it four quarterbacks and four picks. Uh, So again, with the fourth pick, I have the Panthers taking Justin Fields. With the fifth pick, I think the Bengals are actually going to go wide receiver here and take Jamar Chase. Uh, Again, they're signaling with the uh, with the signing of that Vikings offensive lineman. I think his name is Sharif or I think it's Sheriff or Sharif or something like that. Uh, he is going to play tackle, and they also have Jonah Williams as well. So that's signaling to me they're not going to take Panay Sewell. So I think they will end up actually taking Jamar Chase, reuniting that dream partnership of Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase, quarterback wide receiver. I think it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, again, Cincinnati needs to put more fans in the stands and some more jerseys as well uh, on top of everything else. So I really do believe that Jamar Chase will be that pick at five, uh, and they will reunite Joe Burrow. Uh, and Jamar Chase. It'll be a lot of fun in Cincinnati. With the sixth overall pick, I think we get back-to-back quarterback wide receiver reunions. Like I mentioned in the last segment, I think the Dolphins will go after Devontae Smith and add him to their wide receiver board, or, or room, I should say. Again, a guy who knows how to play with Tua Tungavailoa, knows Tua's strengths, knows Tua's weaknesses, knows how to get open, the nice little spots in the field that Tua likes to attack as well. I think it'd be a home run pick for both sides. Not to mention Devontae Smith coming off of maybe the best season a wide receiver has ever had in college football. So I I think with the sixth pick, the Dolphins take Devontae Smith. With the seventh pick, I think this is where Penny Sewell gets grabbed by Dan the Man Campbell. Tough guy, wants to build through the trenches. They are in year one of a rebuild. Jared Goff is a different quarterback when he has pressure in his face versus when he doesn't. If you're Detroit, you want to win some games during this rebuild, you're going to want to protect and keep Jared Goff upright. Penny Sewell will be your guy to do that, and I think he will be a franchise left tackle for that team in that city. So with the seventh pick, I have the Detroit Lions taking Panay Sewell. The Falcons, who are now at the eighth pick after trading down from the Panthers in this mock draft, I believe they will take Kyle Pitts. They just can't pass up on another generational offensive weapon for Matt Ryan to play with and Arthur Smith really to scheme and use. With the ninth overall pick, I think the Broncos will trade down to 15 with the New England Patriots. And I think the Patriots will trade it to take Mac Jones. 
I don't think there's a way that Cam Newton is the only quarterback in that QB room next year, and he doesn't have any real legitimate competition. I'm not counting Jared Stidham as a competition. He's already beat Cam's already beat, beaten him out before. So I think they add Mac Jones with the ninth overall pick here, and they really uh, have a true quarterback competition between Mac Jones and Cam Newton. And maybe Cam starts out of the gate, but I think eventually Mac Jones would be handed that team. So nine, I have New England trading up from 15 to nine to select Mac Jones. With the 10th pick, I have the Cowboys taking Patrick Sertain, the cornerback uh, out of Alabama. I think he's going to be a stud, and obviously Dallas needs all the defensive help that can get. So they'll take the first defensive player, and it's the best corner in the draft uh, in Patrick Sertain, in my opinion. The Giants, with the 11th pick, will take Micah Parsons. Joe Judge is a defensive-minded coach, and they want to get some sort of you know linebacker, safety, pass rusher hybrid. They want to get on that, like a lot of teams are doing, like Kansas City with Teron Matthew and the Chargers with Derwin James and the Cardinals with Isaiah Simmons. They take the next guy in Micah Parsons, and I think he would be a home run pick for the New York Giants, who don't really need to go offense. They added a lot of offensive weapons. A lot of teams have them taking Jalen Waddell or Kyle Pitts or guys like that. I don't think they do. I think they have enough offensive weapons now after adding Galladay and John Ross. I think they go defense here with Micah Parsons with the 11th overall pick. With the 12th overall pick, I think the Eagles get Jalen Waddell, who is the weapon they've probably identified for Jalen Hurts the entirety of the draft, and they do believe he will be there available at 12. That's my personal opinion. So I think they get their wish and everything works out for pretty much everybody in this blockbuster trade, and the Eagles get that speedy Jalen Waddell to be sort of the next Deshaun Jackson for that team. And I have the Chargers at 13 taking Rashawn Slater to help out Justin Herbert even more. They obviously got Corey Lindsey, the number one center in the league. Let's get him some interior slash exterior offensive line help wherever you want to play to Rashawn Slater. He can play out of Northwestern. Some even say he's a better tackle prospect than Panay Sewell. I disagree, but I still think he's an incredible tackle prospect. I think he'd be absolutely huge for uh, Justin Herbert and the Los Angeles Chargers. With the 14th pick, I have the Vikings taking Quiddy Pay. They obviously need pass rush help. I think he's the best all-around pass rusher in the draft, but also keep an eye on Greg Rousseau out of Miami. I think he's got a higher ceiling, but Pay definitely has a higher floor than Rousseau. So I think the Vikings go with him out of Michigan. And finally, for the last pick of this mock draft, I have the Broncos, who obviously traded down from 9 to 15 in this mock I think they'll take Elijah Vera Tucker, the uh, offensive lineman out of the USC, sort of a versatile guy. Or who knows, maybe they can trade that pick for Sam Darnold or something like that. That's my mock draft. I want to let you guys know uh, that that's how I'm going to be doing mock drafts in the future. Uh, Top 15 picks instead of just top 10. And I'm going to do sort of a prediction instead of what my personal opinion is on who these teams should pick. I'm going to do what I realistically think and predict uh, each of these teams are going to do. Uh, but yeah, I had a lot of fun doing those top 15 picks, and uh, we'll probably do it again real soon. That's going to do it for this segment. On the other side of this final short break, I do want to get to as many free agency moves as I can. Victor Lodipo to the Miami Heat, Evan Fournier uh, to the Boston Celtics, Aaron Gordon to the Denver Nuggets, and of course the two buyout moves, Marcus Aldridge going to the Nets. Uh, on top of that, we also have Andre Drummond going to the LA Lakers. We'll get into all that great stuff right after this final short break. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. back here at the GSMC Sports Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Alex Masper. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode and to be continuing to listen to the show 
If you are a returning listener, we really do appreciate you. I just finished giving you my sort of spiel on the Eagles side of that trade, and I gave you an updated NFL mock draft. Again, I think the Eagles were smart in giving Jalen Hurts a full year this year, uh, again, with limited weapons and a new coach, so I don't know how well he's going to do, but he deserves a fair shot after he flashed some potential last season, specifically in that game versus the New Orleans Saints. Uh, I think 2022 is going to be the real focus for the Eagles, especially if they have potentially a top three, five, maybe even first overall draft pick next season. They compare that with the Miami Dolphins 2022 first round pick as well. For the final segment of today's show, I do want to break down those awesome NBA trade deadline moves. Again, I expected today's episode to really be jam-packed with all of these moves and deep diving them and stuff. I will do more of that this coming week, but again, this NFL blockbuster was just so big and infected so many teams in the draft order and mock drafts and such. Uh, so I had to really talk about that a lot as well. So let's just break down quickly some of these moves that were made during the NBA trade deadline. A lot of them by contenders. So of course the Miami Dolphins added Victor Oladipo from the Houston Rockets uh, and really gave up nothing. They gave up Kelly Olenek, Avery Bradley, who didn't really play for them this year because of injury, uh, and a pick swap as well. And they add Victor Oladipo, a guy who's wanted to be in Miami for so long. Again, it was weird because Kyle Lowry was really the apple eye of the Miami Heat. Uh, they really wanted to go after him. It appeared that they really wanted to add him. But Toronto decided to hang on to him past the deadline and uh, hopefully look for a sign-in trade via free agency is what I'm assuming they're trying to do. So Miami pivoted last second and went after Victor Oladipo, who a lot of people thought would sign with Miami in free agency. Again, there were a lot of teams like Golden State, apparently Boston, who were interested in trading for Victor Oladipo, but they were fearing that he wouldn't re-sign with them because, again, he has been linked to Miami so much. He is so close with a lot of players on that team. You remember the smiles and laughing that he would do with the Heat team after the Pacers lost to them uh, in that playoff series. Uh, he's had a great year this year. This past month, he's averaged about 25 a game, 20 on the season. He hasn't had the greatest shooting performances, but again, the whole Houston team hasn't been great either. I think he's going to be a huge addition for this Miami Heat team, and I think it puts them right back uh, on top of the Eastern Conference. And I think they're going to make the Eastern Conference Finals. I think it's going to be them versus the Nets. Uh, if they added Kyle Lowry to it, I would have told you that I think the Heat would win, but I think the Nets right now would still beat them in six or seven games. But what's going to be so huge about Victor Oladipo is he's going to open up opportunities for Tyler Hero and Duncan Robinson last Last year and in the bubble, Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero really took the entire NBA by storm, and nobody was expecting them to pop off the way that they did. So this season, there's more tape on them. They understand that they got to run Duncan Robinson off the three-point line and sort of push Hero a little bit around and sort of pick on him on defense. Victor Oladipo is an all-NBA defender, Was he, uh, led the league in steals in 2018 as well. He's one of the best perimeter defenders and point of the fact attack defenders in the entire league. He's obviously a great spot up shooter as well, but most importantly, he can do stuff off the dribble as well. He's now a third ball handling threat in that starting five. Obviously, Jimmy and Bam do their thing, but now add Victor Oladipo. Your three best defenders have to be guarding Oladipo, Bam, and Jimmy, at least in the starting five, if you're an opposing defense. Duncan Robinson now gets to be chased around by their a team's fourth best defender. Same with Tyler Hero. It's going to open up so many opportunities for them as well as Bam and Jimmy and sort of relieve the pressure off them as well. And now Jimmy Butler can do what he does best, which is sort of be a help defender. I don't think there's a better help defender in the league than Jimmy Butler when he gets to play sort of a free safety-like role on the defensive end of the basketball floor, where he gets to float around in the paint and sort of on the perimeter, hunting down steals, trying to get down you know loose balls, pick off passes essentially. Again, like a free safety type role, but on the basketball court, that's when he's at his best. He'll be able to do that with Victor Oladipo now, because Bam can always guard that big that's so dominating for somebody else's team, like an Anthony Davis or, or a Nikola Jokic or something like that. But they need somebody who can guard guards. And Jimmy Butler has been obviously the guy from Miami to do that. Now it's going to be Victor Oladipo. So I can't wait to see how Oladipo gets to play finally in a team that he wants to play for. Again, he's bounced around the league a little bit. Indiana never found a long-term home. He sort of had that, that uh, Tobias Harris route, who's obviously thriving in Philly this year. Didn't have a great year last year, but this year has been a huge part of Philadelphia's success. I think Victor Oladipo, now that he gets to play in a place that he's wanted to play for really the last three seasons, Ever since Victor Oladipo really, even before he got hurt, people were talking about him potentially going to Miami at some point, how close he was with Dwayne Wade, how he co-owns a gym in Miami, that he lives and trains and works out there almost year-round uh, on top of the NBA season. So for him to play in Miami, which is a city he's called home for the past couple of seasons, I think it's going to be huge for him. And again, he's still in his prime. He's 28 years old as well, which is huge. But again, with that point of attack defense, it's going to help lift some of the weight on the defensive end of the floor off of Jimmy Butler's shoulders. Also on the offensive end, like I mentioned, it's going to open up a lot of lanes and opportunities to get Duncan Robinson back on track so he can take the league by storm like he did last year. Now Miami is sort of building a team that might be even better than last year's. 
Again, they're on a five-game losing streak right now, but Victor Oladipo hasn't played for them yet. Uh, and again, they've had a lot of roster movement the past couple of uh, days, of course, so they they haven't won a lot of games. But when they get back on track, and I think they will once Victor Oladipo starts playing, this team can make some serious noise in the playoffs. They don't have maybe the, the bona fide superstars that you see that you know Brooklyn and Philadelphia have in Milwaukee, but they have a lot of people. That is a deep roster man in a year where depth is important because of COVID and everything like that. And adding Victor Oladipo, you have now three out of, I think three out of the five people in your starting lineup are elite defenders. Uh, maybe four if you consider a Trevor Reese there. He's one of the best three and D guys in the league as well. So the Heat are going to make a lot of noise defensively in the playoffs and that's going to be huge going up against Brooklyn potentially in an Eastern Conference uh, final series where Brooklyn plays terrible defense but has such good of an offense. Uh, Victor Oladipo helps on both the offensive and defensive end of the floor. And again, when players play in cities that they've always wanted to play in, that they've been desperately trying to get to, they play better. We saw how good Anthony Davis played last year when he got to where he wanted to go. I'm not saying Victor Oladipo is going to have that level of an impact in Miami, but we haven't seen Victor Oladipo play for a team that he's wanted to play for in quite some time. And it's going to be a lot of fun to see uh, him play with the Miami Heat for the rest of this season. And I'm assuming they're going to work on an extension. I don't think he'll be going anywhere. He now falls under the bird rights category as well for Miami. So that's huge. And, uh, uh, for Miami, they're keeping some cap space flexibility open potentially as well for a guy like Kawhi Leonard with the Los Angeles Clippers. Who knows if he'll actually leave L.A. or anything like that. But that team also made a move. The Clippers ended up trading Rajon Rondo, uh, giving the Atlanta uh, Hawks uh, Lou Williams. And an interesting move. I understand they need a point guard definitely for sure. Rajon Rondo can do that. But they said they brought him over for leadership and chemistry purposes. Rondo is not a, a – he's a leader on the court. He's got the best basketball IQ maybe in the entire league, second to only maybe LeBron. James but he has a chemistry issue with teammates he's a tough guy to play with apparently and again moving off of Lou Williams who's been the heart and soul of that Clippers organization since pre-Kawhi Paul George it feels like that final Clipper team before they added Kawhi and PG that made the playoffs and took that you know incredible warrior team to six or seven games that core doesn't exist Trez Harrell is gone now Austin Rivers is gone and of course now Lou Williams has gone too. Those were really the heart and soul of that team. It's a whole new brand really with the Los Angeles Clippers. They needed to make a move and I think a point guard they needed was Rayshon Rondo but I think they gave up too much in Lou Williams who I think would be a fantastic player and will be a fantastic player with the Atlanta Hawks in his home state of Georgia. I think he's going to be fantastic for them this year in their pursuit of a playoff push. It's going to be a lot of fun to see the Atlanta Hawks in the playoffs. They're a high flying offense. Now add uh, Lou Williams coming off the bench for that team. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and if Lou Williams can sort of maybe rejuvenate his career now when he's back home in Atlanta sort of proved the doubters wrong that could be a huge acquisition for them specifically in the Eastern Conference playoffs uh, with Nate McMillan at the helm now as the interim head coach who I'm assuming will be the head coach for a couple of years now there in Atlanta he's done an absolutely uh, incredible job another trade that was made was Aaron Gordon going from the Orlando Magic to the Denver Nuggets when I think is the most underrated move of the day again Nicole Jokic is not your traditional big man he's not going to sort of be that big physical guy around the rim that high-flying athletic guy Aaron Gordon is and I think a backcourt of Aaron Gordon and the passing superstar big Nikola Jokic is going to be a lot of fun it's going to be so much fun to see Nikola Jokic lob the ball up to Aaron Gordon who's one of the best dunkers if not the best dunker in the entire uh, NBA <clears throat> and again Jokic is a little soft on the defensive end of the floor, and again, he's not your traditional big physical big man that you would like to see in the playoffs. Aaron Gordon is an athletic freak. He can also shoot the three as well. But in a team that where really the lane is open and the, and the paint's been open, that's why Jeremy Grant thrived there for so long uh, in Denver was because the paint is not clogged up. They have a lot of shooters on that team. And again, Jokic is not a guy that's going to sit in the paint all game like we see some of these traditional big men do. So the lane's always open for these slashers that play the three or the four or these big athletic guys. Aaron Gordon's going to be able to get sort of that role that Grant got for a couple years in Denver. And I think Gordon's going to thrive in it. He's been a talent player on a non-good Orlando organization and team for a while now. He's going to be on a bigger stage in the Western Conference, uh, again, with probably the best bat- passing league in the entire league in uh Uh, Jokic passing him, throwing him lobs. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch the Denver Nuggets come uh, Western Conference playoffs. They're going to be a high-flying offense combination of their shooters. That's going to be a lot of fun as well. And there were two big-time buyout market signings as well, and this is what we'll close the episode with. LaMarcus Aldridge, who a lot of people had pegged going to the Miami Heat in a surprising last-second sort of change of mind, ends up signing with the Brooklyn Nets, which is one of the more interesting buyout market signings. I did not think he would sign there. I think it would come down to the Celtics, Miami, and the Lakers. Uh, Blake Griffin got 17 points this last game as a Brooklyn Net. They played the sort of same position as that backup big. I don't know how it's going to work out now. They sort of have Blake, LaMarcus Aldridge, and Deion Jordan sort of all playing this big role, uh, which I'm not sure how it's going to work out come playoff time. But LaMarcus Aldridge is a proven 
player in this league. He's not the player he once was, but in the post, he's still very effective. He's a better three-point shooter than he was, he is now than he was at the beginning of part of his career. Uh, I thought Miami would have been the move for him because he would have been a guaranteed starting spot. Now, are they going to start LaMarcus Aldridge potentially at the four? Uh, I could maybe see it. And then you have, but again, with Joe Harris there, once everybody's healthy, it's usually Kyrie at the one. Uh, Harden at the two, Harris at the three, Katie at the four. So I don't know how you're going to have LaMarcus Aldridge and Blake Griffin coming off the bench when they're the exact same player, in my opinion, skill set wise, sort of play style wise. Uh, again, I thought Miami would have the perfect fit for Aldridge, but the Nets are absolutely dominating the buyout market, and they still have some more roster spots uh, when some other guys get bought out eventually as well, so keep an eye on that. But uh, overall and all on the LaMarcus uh, Aldridge signing, I really thought Miami would have been the fit for him, or even Boston as well as a as a starting big there uh, to start for an Eastern Conference playoff team I thought would have been his goal. But to go for Brooklyn now, probably coming off the bench, and who knows what the role's going to be with really with Blake Griffin there as well. Uh, it's going to be an interesting situation to see play out for sure. And the last of big name buyout market signing was uh, Andre Drummond, who picked the Lakers over the Celtics, who were the favorites, I think, uh, the first night he was bought out. But for him to start with the LA Lakers is going to be a lot of fun to watch. They've obviously started Dwight Howard and JaVale McGee next to Anthony Davis before, and that has thrived uh, last season. Uh, Andre Drummond's a better version of those two guys. So I think the Lakers got better with this move. And when the Lakers are fully healthy, I do believe they're the best team in the NBA. Now, I'm not going to say LaMarcus Ald- or not LaMarcus Aldridge, that uh, the Andre Drummond signing for the LA Lakers is a game-changing move that's going to make them a dynasty or something like that. It's not. But if they can win championships with JaVale McGee and uh, Dwight Howard playing alongside Anthony Davis, because again, they like AD playing the four and having a really tall traditional big man next to him. Andre Dummond is a better, better version of a rim runner and a shot blocker and a rebounder than those two guys are. And he's going to be able to contribute right away with AD's injury. Uh, he's really going to be one of the go-to options on that Lakers offense for the next couple of weeks as LeBron and Anthony Davis rest up. But I think it was definitely an interesting move for sure. And I think the right one for Andre Drummond as I think he's going to serve a major, major role for the Lakers championship aspirations as they looked and try to go uh, back-to-back. But all in all, it was an absolutely loaded weekend in sports uh, with that NFL crazy blockbuster trade and obviously a lot of fun during the NBA trade deadline. As well, a lot of moves coming down to the wire. Again, we were all refreshing Twitter constantly to say, where's Oladipo going? Uh, where's Evan Fournier going? And things like that. Uh, so it was a lot of fun to watch. It was a lot of fun to really experience. And again, that NFL trade was also awesome as well. And hopefully we get some more days like that where both the NFL and NBA just give us some absolutely crazy, crazy news. All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of the GSMC Sports Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Before I let you go, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, Leave us a five-star review or just a positive review in general. And follow us on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We would appreciate it if you would do all three of those things. Again, I have been your host, Alex Masper. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode, and I will see you all in the next one. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program